Good afternoon and welcome to the Adelaide Biomed City Mini Review Webinar Series. My name's Andrew Zanatino and I'm going to be your chair this afternoon. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people, uh, the original custodians on the land on which we meet here in the city of Adelaide. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, before I start, I'd like to actually um, re uh, remind people that uh, you can use the Q&A section of your Zoom window, um, and you can actually relay any questions that you have for our presenter today via me, or alternatively, you can actually go live with a raise of hand. This afternoon, we'll hear about the Adelaide Centre for Epigenetics and the South Australian Immunogenomic Cancer Research Institute, or SAGENCI. Unfortunately, um, Associate Professor Luciano Martellotto is unable to join us uh, as he's travelling back from Lawn, but uh, Professor Jose Polo has graciously agreed to present on his behalf. As Jose is actually new to Adelaide and to many of you watching, I would like to tell you a little bit about this incredible scientist uh, who we are absolutely thrilled to have been able to recruit to the University of Adelaide. So Jose Maria Pobolo was born in Buenos Aires, uh, where he actually graduated from the Buenos Aires University as a biochemist. Uh, in 2002, Jose began his graduate studies at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York under the supervision of Dr. Ari Melnick and uh, people who are in developmental biology. Uh, that's a name that's very familiar to many of us, uh, where he worked on transcriptional mechanisms of BCL6, repression complex in lympham uh, lymphamogenesis and B-cell maturation. In 2008, he obtained his PhD and uh, moved to Boston uh, to the laboratory of Dr. Conrad Hochlinger and uh, at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute to work on reprogramming of adult cells into induced pluripotent stem cells or iPS cells. Uh, in particular, this work focused on acquisition of immortality and the existence of epigenetic memory during reprogramming. In uh, June 2011, Jose established his independent research group at Monash University. In 2012, Jose was awarded an NHMRC Career Development Fellowship. 2014, a Sylvia and Charles Bertel Senior Medical Research Fellowship. And in 2018, an ARC Future Fellowship to continue his work in the molecular mechanisms governing the reprogramming processes and the epigenetic mechanisms underpinning cell fate. In 2016, he also found co-founded Mography Limited to translate reprogramming technologies into therapies receiving several accolades, including the 2019 Scripps Innovation Award. Lucky wasn't busy enough already, he starts a company as well. So an incredible, incredible scientist. His work in epigenetics, reprogramming and cancer has been published in journals such as Nature, Cell, Nature Genetics, Cell Stem Cell and Nature Medicine, among others, as well as recognized with several awards, including the Merit Award for American Society of Hematology, Norgal Metcalf Award, Victorian Young Tall Poppy Award and the Monash Vice Chancellor Award. In October 2021, Jose was recruited to the University of Adelaide as the inaugural director of the Adelaide Centre for Epigenetics, or ACE, which we'll be hearing a little bit about today, and program leader of the recently established Sagenzi. In Adelaide, he will continue his work in epigenetics and his applications to reprogramming, early embryogenesis and cancer. And I'm really delighted to be able to introduce you to Jose today. And the title of his combined presentations is Exploring the Boundaries of Nuclear Reprogramming, as well as an introduction to ACE's single cell and spatial omics technology laboratories. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Jose and um, welcome, Jose. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you for such a nice um, introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Um, and I came to, to establish a center for epigenetics and also to lead a cancer program in Sciency. And so why? Why we want a center for epigenetics in the University of Adelaide and an epigenetic cancer program? So I, I know that the, the, um, the audience is, is, is heterogeneous and white. So I will explain just a very little of why I think that epigenetic is important and why I have dedicated my last 20 years to work on that. So I will start with development very fast. And, and it's just to remind of something that is amazing about the human body. That is, as we all know, we start with the zygote, yes, which is one cell, 
yes. And the cycle developed into the blastocyst and then into a cyclamen embryo, which is already implanted. Everything goes well. You get a beautiful baby. This is my son, actually, 11 years ago when he was born, the day that he was born, actually. And something that is amazing is that in the, the human body and fairy mammal, we are made of hundreds and thousands of different cell types. Depends how, actually how you define a cell type. It can be hundreds of thousands, millions of actually every one of your cells is a different cell. And uh, we know all our cells are different. They look different. They stain different. They have different morphology. Very importantly, different functions. And we know that they all came from one cell, which it means that the information to make all the cells of the body was present in this one cell. And something that was very important to answer is what happened to that information during development. Yes, what happened with that information in your own cells? So many years ago in the 60s, well, in 58, John Gordon did a, an experiment where he took the nucleus of a mature cell, of an adult cell. He, he did this working in Xenopus with frogs. And he took that nucleus and put it into an enucleated egg. And he was able to rederive a whole Xenopus again. And with that, he demonstrated two very important things. One is that the, the genetic information, yes, is not lost in development. So, and this is, has a, pro, a profound thing. That is, every cell of the body contains exactly the same information, yes. So, if that's the case, Yes, there is another layer that has to be controlling, yes, which information is displayed. So in my opinion, John Gordon also created with that experiment, the field of epigenetics, which is basically the field that is that looks at what happened with that information. So this have been already at the same time being proposed by Conrad Warrington with his famous epigenetic landscape, where the idea is that you have the genes are in a state in this landscape where um, they are forced to, to, to control the gene expression. And this landscape is very famous, at least uh, uh, among, uh, among scientists. But he also actually thought on the forces that control the landscape. And these are what we call the epigenetic forces, yes. And in, 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 in order, let's, if we put everything together, basically what this means is that. If you see it with how I see um, biological processes, yes, at the end of the day, they are all, yes, a matter of controlling the epigenome, yes. Because at the end of the day, as we were saying, all the cells of the body, yes, they have the same gene. And even when the genes are mutating in some diseases, they have to produce a change in the epigenetic landscape to move that cell from one state to the other one. So this is very clear, of course, during development, where you have a cell going through these different epigenetic states. And for example, you can start with the cell of the inner cell mass of pluripotent cell, and then go down into the maturation or development, yes. You can mimic this in vitro, and it's what we call differentiation. You can reprogram. If you can control the, the, the landscape, that is what specifically I do, and I will talk a little bit more, you can control this landscape. You just take a cell from one state and you can reprogram it directly into another state. And that's what and Andrew was saying. This is the famous iPS cells, for example, where we take a cell of the skin and we can convert it into an, a pluripotent cell. Um, and then, of course, aging can be seen as part of this process. And this is how our lab see it, yes. It's just a change in the, a continued change in this landscape, yes and taking a cell from one state to another state. And of course, we see disease in the same way, where basically that landscape is a natural or physiological landscape. It puts a cell into a pathological landscape. And it's through this, we believe that if we, for example, control this landscape as we can, we can also revert in disease state. And this is where ACE, yes, the Adelaide Center for Epigenetics, Overlap with agency, yes, where um, many of cancers, yes, and tumors are driven, yes, specifically driven by mutations in epigenetics modifiers, 
or also even if they are not epigenetic modifiers, as I said, and in order to a cancer cell to be in any state, it has to modify that epigenetic plate. So we overlap in that um, goal, yes, on, on that part of the field. So I will not talk now specific about science or, or AIDS. I will introduce basically um, Luciano and I, Luciano Martellotto and I, that we were brought, yes, to, to work into this. And in the future, of course, we will be knowing all of us. Um, so definitely in order to understand this landscape, yes, to be able to describe the landscape, we need a lot of technology. And that's where Luciano comes in. So Luciano is an expert in single cell technology at the uh, classical level, yes, and also at spatial level, yes. And he has developed his career trying to, to get into that. And by the way, he doesn't look as young anymore, yes. Anyway, so, and, his trajectory is Luciano obtained is a biotechnologist. Yes, he has a degree in biotechnology and molecular biology. Then he obtained a PhD in molecular biology, basic molecular biology. He did then a postdoc in cancer biology, and that's when he got an appetite for understanding disease. Yes, and he did a postdoc, and I would say he pioneered actually the use of single cell, yes, to understand cancer. And this is when he was in New York in Memorial Sloan. Catering. And actually, he has all these beautiful papers on that. So if you are interested in this, I highly recommend it that you go and, and check them out. Then he came back to Melbourne and he and became a team leader, yes, also in the BCCC, in uh, this associated with Peter Mack, yes, um, and also heading now single cell innovations. Why? Why we need him single cell innovations? Because this field advances at a very high pace. And in order to, to, to keep on top of, of the field and being able to answer and like more elegant and more exquisite questions, yes, and getting to really into underneath of what is going on, yes, in, in this, um, at the level of the tumors or in any other disease, yes, at, this, at the single cell level, we need to keep innovating, yes. And that's what basically um, Luciano is doing. He adapts or he creates new techniques, yes. Then and he was recruited to, to lead the, the single cell and special technologies lab in Harvard Medical School, yes. And, and now in December this year, December last year, we were able to recruit it back to Adelaide, yes, to head the single and special omic technology lab in as part of ACE and Sciences. It was a co-recruitment, yes. Um, so, uh, Luciano has published amazing papers like that. He is such a collaborative uh, person. Yes, I highly recommend it. If you haven't met him to met, go and talk to, to him, you have any thoughts on single cell and omics in general. Yes, he has first half of paper in many of these in nature medicine, analyzing how the single cell, at the single cell level, how the environment and how the, the heterogeneity of cancers and work. And he has contributed to a um, different type of biology. He's very interested in that question. So he's very agnostic of um, the model. He has worked with me in the past and in, in pluripotency as well in cancer, and you will see in immunology, et cetera. So just to round up that part, I will say um, he, um, he will be here he will, in this building, in the HMS building, the sixth floor, yes. His team is small, but he's growing. He's looking for junior postdocs and a research assistant. So contact him if you're interested. He can do wet and dry, yes. So he can, of course, generate and do the, the, the analysis and also generate and generate the data as well as analyze it, yes. He, um, as we said, he specializes in technology. He has set up a, 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 an amazing lab, yes with almost every possible technology that you can imagine in single cell. Yes, they are all there. But again, if you are thinking in doing a, a, sing, a single cell experiment or you think that your tissue of interest or disease of interest has a lot of heterogeneity, I would recommend that you talk with him. He will give you great advice and more likely you will be able to collaborate with him. Yes, and he will be develop, developing new techniques. That's basically his mandate to develop new techniques, adapt and help and people to, 
to, to use them to answer the scientific questions. And as I was saying, he has hundreds of collaborations, yes. And so in a nutshell, yes, if you, um, he will run the single and special OMIT lab at ACE and Sciency, he's highly collaborative and he will develop and uh, adapt early stage and techniques, yes, and you will be able to collaborate with him. So now to me, yes, so this is a little bit of my bio, yes, so I was born in Argentina, as Andrew said, I studied biochemistry, then I went to New York to do my PhD, where I work in B cell and lymphomas um, and transcription factors. Then I moved to Boston to work in reprogramming and went to Monash to keep working in reprogramming and cell fate. And now I have been recruited to Adelaide and, uh, and I will still continue in cell fate and epigenetics. Yes. So, I have worked a lot in trying to understand nuclear reprogramming, yes. Um, and, and I use mouse models in the past. I was still using some mouse models and I use them to understand really the, the, the biochemical and molecular mechanism. Yes, I, I would say that my lab is specialized in trying to understand the series of events of dynamics events that happen in any cell fate process. As I was saying, I see all these processes as very similar process. And so I done it in mouse. We have done it in human as well. Yes, working and especially in the last time and trying to understand very early and pluripotency and creating models of early pluripotency. And I have applied the same type of vision to Alzheimer's disease in the last years. I will not be working on that, but I am, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to collaborate, of course, and I understand and, and the basic of neuroscience, I would say, after working for almost five years in, in Alzheimer's. And we, again, using single cell technologies and reprogramming technology, we were able to, to, to try to, to give a view on how we think that there is this self fate this epigenetic chain underpinning many of the, um, of the of aspects of Alzheimer's disease. We also apply it to aging, as I was saying at the beginning. Yeah, so we apply in this case in collaboration with Helen Abad, we apply it to intestinal stem cell aging. Again, as a process where our cell is, under, is undergoing different epigenetic changes that end up in aging process. In this case was um, the incapacity of age or old intestinal stem cells to um, to, to create more stem cells and more cells, and we were able to revert that by understanding the process. And, and lately I've been working in prostate cancer, yes, also applying the same technologies, applying, understanding what's this um, um, landscape undergoing under the hood, and then using reprogramming technologies to try to overcome this problem. And in this case, we this have been in collaboration with Philip Ripija and Renee Taylor, and my team and my team, and we've been able to find many targets and actually start targeting, etc. So, in summary, I, I hope that you see how this the, this view of the cell fate as an epigenetic, the change in the epigenetic landscape as the core of development, maturation, disease, and aging. Yes, and this view can be applied through multiple systems. Yes, as I do it in my lab, and as I done with many collaborations that are current. Yes have collaborations in, across the country, in the United States, Europe, and actually many in South Australia, yes, like in CCV, UniSA, and SA Pathology, yes. We work in, in several um, projects. And of course, I have also already, and in the past, worked with people in the University of Adelaide. I'm more than excited to be able to work more. So I summarize always my talk with the same slide. I'm sorry if you have seen this slide, but I think that is very important for especially the young people. Yes, basic research matters. Yes. Every time we enter into one of these projects, yes, we go there to try to understand what's going on. Yes, where we think one of the most important pro processes that is the epigenetic changes. And that has allowed us to find in many ways to improve and discover new solutions to different end problems. Yes. 
So please keep doing that. And thank you, and I will answer any question. Um, thanks so much, Jose. That's that's amazing. Um, the, the list of incredibly impactful publications was a standout for me, and uh, knowing that you've contributed, and as well as um, uh, Lou has contributed to an amazing amount of, of, of high quality findings over the years. Look, um, I'm going to open this up for um, questions. If anyone does have any questions, they can use the chat function, um, and I can then relay those questions to Jose. Um, but while we wait for those, I might just start off, if I could, Jose, with a question really around the difference between structural and epigenetic changes. Clearly, we have cells in our body, such as T and B cells, which actually undergo wholesale genetic change. And equally, I think even in the context of aging, we do see some structural changes in the lengths of, of the ends of our chromosomes or the telomeres. Um, and that's been attributed in the context of induced pluripotent stem cells to actually sort of in some way um, affect the ability to form essentially normal embryos. Uh, can you sort of comment about that, those sort of changes in, in, in the structural yeah. DNA and, and, and the like? Thanks. So of course, yes, they are genetic changes. I will not deny that. Yes, otherwise, yeah. as soon as I walk out of my office today, somebody will come and hit me. So yes, they are, they, of course, they are genetic changes. But those genetic changes, they have to do something, yes. And what they do is produce a transcriptional change. Or there is two things that they can do, or, or produce a transcriptional change, or they produce, a, let's call it now, enzymatic change. Basically, a mechanic, the, the gene that they are producing is mutated and is defective, yes. And it could be a metabolic change, so they cannot metabolize something. It can be that it, it activates or overactivates a kinase, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of this process end up, in one way or another, signaling back into the, the pigenome to and create a transcriptional output out of that, yes? And yes, in some cases, the epigenome will not be able to be, you can change the epigenome output and if you are missing an enzyme and the enzyme is in, there is nothing that you can do. I get that, yes? But in many cases, yes, one of them being cancer, for example, is, is not necessarily that Overexpression, overactive kindness, the problem. The kindness per se is not the problem. It's all what the kindness do. Yes. And somebody there probably is not, is not agreeing, but that's okay. We can discuss it. Um, so, um, and I will give you an example, for example, that is very interesting, in my opinion. In prostate, in, when we did our, our analysis in prostate cancer and we predicted what needed to be changed, yes, we have many of the cancer that were actually the cancer that we were our modeling was already and has gone in hormone desensibilization. So it, because it had a mutation in the, in the estrogen, in the estrogen receptor, androgen receptor. So um, of course it was not going to respond to. However, when we did the analysis, <clears throat> the first thing that the system said that, oh, this gene needs to be put in back, not knowing there was a mutation, yes. This needed to be overexpressed because the whole cascade underneath is failing. Yes. So yeah. basically, that was one way, or the other way was to restore the cascade underneath without being able to restore that. And that's what you can do. So, yes, is, there is a communication there between, basically, they, I would say for the last 30 years, et cetera, we have focused on these mutations, but those mutations are choking with the rest of the body and they, or the rest of the cell. And the way that they choke, in many ways, is through the epigenome. So that's why it becomes important. Yeah. Thank you, Jose. Look, we have a question from Melanie Gentgall, um, who's asked, says, thanks, Jose, mind blown. Um, for a novice like me, can you explain what the new frontiers are for epigenetics in cancer research and medicine? Yes. So I will say there is, um, so there is one in the diagnostic aspect, of course, um, because, is so complex, yes, is you might the, at the genetic level, you have basically one code, yes. At the epigenetic level, you have, we can discuss this, but you have hundreds literally of layers yeah. all talking to each other in different combinations. That give you like almost an, in human terms, an infinite number of combinations, yes. So um, 
that from a, for example, if you are talking about the stratification or of patients, etc., is much more um, um, fine grain than just one mutation or a couple of these. So in that way, I think that we have it's having more, and we have more when we can apply omics at a large scale. And then I think that the frontier is to try to have epigenetic, specific epigenetic um, drugs that we can accurately, yes, and very specifically and modify one, a target, target the epigenetic change. Because now we are using drugs that can, for example, they acetylate everything, but you don't want your acetylate everything. Your, your, your normal homeostasis depends on, on having the epigenome doing the right thing. So being able to say, okay, this, there is here, what some people call an epi mutation, and go and change it specific, specifically, that's the next level. And of course, delivering all this to the right place, that probably for any drug, yes. Yeah, thank you, Jose. Look, we have a question from Lisa Butler. This is a really good question in relation to the technology that's being developed by Lou and yourself. And it really is around uh, their opportunities in uh, the Adelaide Centre for Epigenetics to look at epigenetic changes in a spatial context. You know, in other words, in a heterogeneous tumour. And as we know, increasingly, the heterogeneity within a tumour type is, is vast. And um, yes. so can you talk to that a bit for us? Yes, so and definitely, yes, there is. And there is many technologies now apply, of course, beyond transcription, yes, that as a person that thinks in epigenetics is just the output of the epigenome, yes. But, and yes, there is. You can do, actually, there is now some techniques to look at the chromatin accessibility at the spatial level single cell, yes. There is a lot of push in trying to do, of course, and even a, a kind of um, um, chip sequencing, yes, like cut and tag at the single cell, especially um, maintaining the spatial resolution as well. So yes, there is, of course, Luciana will have answered this question much better than me, yes. And, but yes, there is a um, space and a, that's the job of ACE actually, Lisa, as you know well. <laughs> like the job is to be there, yes, to, yeah. if there is somebody doing it, we will get it. And if not, and there is a clear um, need to develop a technology like that, yes, of course we will also be interested in developing such a technology that maybe we didn't think about it. And one of the, basically the mandates of ACE is that one, is to be, to put us, Adelaide, yes, at the forefront of epigenetics, yeah, that's why they created, and we are going to try to do our best. And, um, and the idea is, that in order to do that, we need to be super innovative and keep developing the technique. So we don't want to be the ones looking at Basically, all, all these places are doing all this because they develop the technique and we come five years later or six years later now that they become available. Now we want to have them so we can answer those amazing questions that we all have in our head. Yeah. That's brilliant, Jose. Look, we, look, I'm conscious of the time, but we do have two more questions. If you're happy to, to, to answer those, I really yes. appreciate that. A question from Paul Thomas. It says, how much variation do you see across a population of induced pluripotent cells? if you compare their transcriptomes by single cell sequencing? And does this point to multiple pluripotent states within that, that pool? Yes, so that's an excellent question. My short answer is yes, there is variation. And yes, I'm under the my view of this, clear, I think that this is a math fault. Um, pluripotency exists in a continuum. Yes, in life exists in a continuum. The, basically from pre implantation, I, depends how you call it, from the modula to the post implantation yeah. state. And, and in, in, in vivo, this is a continuum, constantly changing, 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 because there is no stop. In, in vitro, we have learned how to stabilize some aspects of that and capture. I always say that pluripotent cells or IPS cells are an artifact, yes, because they are stuck in one thing. And yes, in that way that when we stack them there, we are capturing certain parts. And some of them are capturing one place and some on others and some more. And there is more medias and different, every day there is one more media yeah. and different medias they capture it in different yeah. states. So yes, the answer is, I think in that way as well, yeah. 
And look, thank you for that. And one final question from Nadim Shadiak, which I think is really highlighting a, a really interesting aspect of this sort of incredible data rich information that you're able to create with the types of single cell sequencing capacity that are going to be developing here in Adelaide. It says precision cancer uh, therapies for cancer targeting the specific pathways required determining the expression of genes, signaling the molecules and receptors. There is such a heterogeneous and widespread of genotypic information to unpack. Do we currently have the processing power, uh, artificial intelligent machine learning capabilities to decode this and inform the personalized treatments? Uh, if not, how far are we off from that tech to converge? Um, okay, that's... It's a, yeah. it's a tough one, I know. <laughs> no, and it's a long one. So, yeah. yes. Okay, at the surface of the question, yes, definitely we are just scrapping the surface. I will agree with that in a way. I think that that's what is implied, yes. Um, I think that more and more we are getting deep. We have the capability. What we need is more time and more investment into yeah. these areas, yes. Um, yeah. For instance, as an ACE, just to give you an idea, no, because I'm selling it, but I'm here <laughs> to introduce you, ACE. Sure. Yes, and Sciency, yes. ACE, for example, is a small center, yes. And one of, we, when we thought about it, we designed it with three legs. One that is developing of technologies like Luciano, then people like me that apply this technology trying to understand different biology questions. And then, of course, the other one needed to be a computational person. And that's why we are trying to recruit. Sciency is doing exactly the same. It has, of course, Luciano that belongs to Sciency as well. And, and, did, and the Sciency will have a pure program in computational um, science applied to cancer, but in general, yes. And because it's completely necessary to keep developing yeah. that in order to, I will say, and hopefully nobody gets offended, I will say to really utilize all the data that we are generating, yeah. yes? And we, like, we, yes, like we really need to invest on computational analysis and, and AI and all that in order to really maximize all what we get. Yes. Um, Hopefully a project for the Adelaide Biomed City partners to actually bring together and actually make sure that we use our resources um, collectively. Look, I can't thank you enough, Jose, for a fantastic presentation today. I've got to say that we had an outstanding number of people online. We had about 81 people, which is a really good outcome. So thank you for everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, but before we close off, I'd also like to remind everyone that uh, these mini reviews are actually being recorded and they are available on the ABMC website. So if you go to the mini review, um, so go to the ABMC website, you look under mini review um, and uh, uh, you can actually see the banner, the webinars, and you can watch this and past webinars. But incredibly, if you actually missed any details from today's presentation, you can go back and have a look and uh, please contact uh, uh, Jose or Lou if you do have any questions or uh, opportunities for collaboration. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to encourage your colleagues about these webcasts and uh, to, to build the awareness of them. And they actually happen every Tuesday afternoon from 4.30 till five o'clock. Um, join us, uh, they're great opportunities for exchange of information and to, to meet new people that you would otherwise find it challenging to meet just like you met Jose today. But uh, on behalf of uh, myself, Jose, thanks ever so much for a fantastic presentation and for for um, uh, sort of telling us a little bit about the growing capacity within the, the precinct, but also thank you for agreeing to come to Adelaide. It's delightful to have you. You're a fantastic Hi. addition to, the, to our scientific scene here. So uh, again, thank you for joining us and uh, please join us same bat time and same bat channel next week. Cheerio everyone.